Welcome guys, welcome to my very first video on my new YouTube channel. In this channel, it's an educational channel. What we'll be dealing with is construction skills online. That is the name of the channel, construction skills online. The name of my company is called Strawberry Online. It's an online uh, company. We do various uh, courses online, specializing primarily in construction related courses. And my name is Sibusi Sombanga. And I'll be taking you through a course called Tendering and Estimating in Construction. Now, ordinarily, I offer this course offline and it takes anything from two to three days. However, I am going to com consolidate it. I'm going to compress it and I will try and, and split it into three sections. It's got three sections, three modules, basically module one, two, and three. Today, we are only going to be covering module number one. Now in module one, Okay, in module number one, we are basically going to be dealing with a whole lot of things. But before we get there, let me tell you a little, little bit about the course, the background. This course is done at um, NQF level two. That is now equivalent to someone who is doing a grade eight. And the units of measurement are basically the essay metric units. In simple terms, that means kilograms, square meters, meters, kilometers, cubic meters. You, you guys get the idea, right? And then the numeracy required is a grade eight again, because we'll be doing uh, calculations later on in the later modules when we're calculating unit rates and everything. So just be aware that you need to be at least numerate to a grade uh, 10 uh, equivalent. And remember, I said this course is uh, accredited by CETA, that is now the offline version, which I would ordinarily train in a, in a, in a classroom scenario. Uh, as I said, it can take anything two to three days, but now I'm doing an online version. I mean, to make it accessible to people whom I can't reach on the offline uh, platform. So let's go, get straight into it. Uh, module number one is called procure a tender document. It's got three lessons. Lesson one is buying a tender document. Uh, lesson two, the decision to, to tender based on the fact that you've already bought uh, the tender document. Now you want to decide, uh, you know, to tender. We're going to look at what decisions inform that, you know, the, your, 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 what, what thought pattern informs your decision to tender rather. And then lesson number three, we're going to be dealing with the site inspection visit. And then in module two, it's called prepare and complete a tender document. Uh, we're going to be looking at information on the tender document, how to really extract it and make sense of everything in the tender document, Cal calculate the allowable cost for work activities, basically calculate the tender rates, add profit markups, you know, to, to your rate so that uh, you can actually have a selling price and then calculate preliminary and blah, 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 preliminary and general pay items that basically better known as your P's and G's and then complete the tender document. And then uh, module number three. In module number three, we'll be looking at uh, submitting a tender document. The lesson we're going to cover there is completing all the tender returnables, you know, all those things that you have to put in your company information, triple BE certificates or, or sworn affidavit, your tax clearance information, CSD, construction program if they want, cash flows, all those, those, those tender returnables. And then actually how to submit the tender document, you know, basically knowing where where it closes, what time it closes, and what information to put on the envelope. So basically, those are the things we'll be looking at in, in, in lesson number 10. 
But let's go to um, module number one, procure a tender document. Buying a tender document. Firstly, before you even think of buying a tender document, you've got to understand there's basically three main types of tenders. The first one is your open tenders. Usually, it's usually issued by government, but even private companies can issue out these open tenders. Open tenders are, are basically, as the word suggests, they're open to everyone. You know, anyone can tender, anyone can submit. No one is going to say don't submit. It's another thing if you qualify or not, but it's open. You know, for you to tender, you know, you can get these. Normally, they put these on the on the newspapers. They can put them online. They can put them on on the municipal notice board. There's various uh, platforms where you would have uh, open tenders advertised. Um, the second type is your invited or closed tenders. This is when the client is just inviting a few contractors to tender. Perhaps the client has worked with these contractors before and he, he knows the quality of work that he wants and it's his money. Usually these are, this would be a private client. So he knows uh the quality of work and he knows the type of contract he wants to work with so he would invite uh those specific contractors to uh, submit tenders and then you get your third type which is basically your negotiate now the negotiate now the negotiated tenders are just to give an example you are doing a, you are going to construct a, a building here now, in this building, you're going to need to have some electrical works. You could invite a specialist subcontractor who's going to do the electrical works and then you negotiate a price with them, you know. So basically, you invite someone and say, hey, man, you know what? This is the budget I have for this. You know, can you do it for this budget? They're going to work the numbers and then they say yes or no. You know, you get the idea. Basically, you negotiate with the with the uh, particular contractor all right so now there's some helpful tips when you're collecting a tender document it's always wise to know if the client wants uh, payment by EFT by cash or by check usually that information is stipulated on the tender advert so before you go and collect your tender document, read and see how the client wants payment done. Because it's pointless showing up at, uh, to buy a tender document carrying cash or bringing your, your card, but then the, 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 the advert says, you know, you must do an electronic payment. So it's always important to note what form of payment that the client has stipulated and then you just do as per stipulation and you must also note if there's going to be a compulsory briefing on site or not and the date and the time for the for the tender briefing okay now let's presume you've bought the, the tender document now you must decide okay you've had a look at it and now you're thinking to yourself do I want to price this document? Do I really want to submit this tender? Now, there's a couple of things that you look at before you make that decision. One of the things you look at is you look at your at the financial resources at your disposal. You know, do you have enough capital? Should you be successful to execute this work? Maybe if you are very low on capital, or at, at the current point, maybe if your capital is tied up somewhere, then it might not be a good idea to submit the tender. I mean, those are the things you're basically going to be looking at. Look at the market conditions. You know, what's happening in the construction industry at the moment? You look at what's going on. How are the, how, is there a lot of work? Is there, is there, you know, if there's a, if there's a lot of work, you know, if you've got a lot of work, you might actually not need to to submit this tender otherwise your resources will be very will be will be stretched if there's little work and you know so you 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 basically look at all these things if there's little work then you obviously want to price and you will know what 
profit margins to use because if there's little work going around then you're going in at very very tight margins so you got to see if you are able to handle those tight profit margins you know before you actually decide to 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 put the tender and you look at your current workload this ties up with the with the with the second with the second one i mean how 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 much work do you how much work do you currently have do you got have you got five projects have you got six projects have you got one project so you got to look at it so that you don't stretch your resources too thin you know the last thing you want is to get a lot of work and not be able to perform when you get the work then that gives you a bad name because now you find that sometimes that you've bitten more than you can chew and then you're pulling resources from this job and you're taking them to that job you know as soon as it looks like you're finishing that that as soon as it looks like you 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 getting ahead in that job you take those resources you put them elsewhere and then it, it really it it's not good for anyone especially the client he won't be happy with that and you look at the the workload for your estimating department is there a lot of tenders that the guys are pricing at the moment and now remember estimating is a high pressure job i know i've been there we used to work till you know 2 a.m at the, at the company that i used to work for you know and and estimating is really really a, a high stress uh situation and you need to constantly constantly meet your deadlines you know it's it's there's, there's just a, a lot of pressure so you look at that and you see if you can take on another uh, uh, job to to price and then you look at the previous experience with similar contracts for example yeah i mean if if this if you're going to be pricing a, a water job with reservoirs if you've had a good experience doing a similar job in the past obviously you'd probably want to do it again however if you've had a bad experience you know doing that type of work you might want to stay away from it let's just say for example i mean you were doing a reservoir and you had to break out your concrete because your, 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 you didn't do it properly. Maybe you, you, your, your concrete team is not up to scratch. So, you know, up until you are, you are jacked up in that area, you probably want to stay away from that sort of work. Otherwise, it's going to cost you a lot of money in the long run. And then you look at the client and the consultant. And, you know, if you've had uh, what kind of experience you've had with this particular client in the past, you know, do they pay on time? You know, do they release the, your, your retention on time? All those things, you know, what kind of a client is this? And the consultant, you know, what experience did you have with the consultant? All these things, they really, uh, up, you know, you take them into account when you make your decision to either tender or not to tender. All right, um, now go straight to lesson number three, which we said was the um, site inspection. Now, um, here at the site inspection, it's normally split up it in, into two. There's the tender briefing, which is normally very packed with contractors. And then you get the site visit. Normally that happens just after the, the tender briefing. Sometimes the client may say that, look, um, the, the tender, the, the site visit is, is not going to happen. But I advise always, always, always go to site to familiarize yourself with what you are getting yourself into. You do not want to get a nasty surprise when you, if, if, say you get awarded the contract when you get to the site and you think to myself oh my gosh what have i got myself into i did not you know envisage what i see so it's very very important i'm stressing it go to the site visit now at the tender briefing it's very important to be on time you know at the, at the tender advert, they will tell you what time to be there. And they, sometimes they give a grace period to say, in, after ten, if, let's, let's say, for example, the tender is, is going to start at, uh, the meeting is going to start at 11 o'clock. They may say that the doors are going to close at 10 past 8. So you have to know what time the meeting is scheduled to start. 
be on time. You don't want to drive all the way 200 kilometers only to get there and they've closed the doors. I've seen this happen so many times. I've seen so many people pitching up late at the tender briefing. And it's, it's just not on, guys. It's not professional. And you want to sign the attendance register as well because when you've signed, when your name is on the, on the attendance register, that is the proof that you attended the meeting. It's no point going to the briefing and then you forget to sign the register. It doesn't matter if the consultant knows you and he saw you there, but the fact that you didn't sign, it means legally you were not at the meeting, even though you were physically present. The only proof that you were at the meeting is your signature and your name and your details on that attendance register. And then ask questions. This is a platform where you can ask uh, questions, you know, ask the client or the consultant. By this time, I mean, you've bought the tender document, you've had a look at it, and basically you've maybe highlighted a few uh, areas where you need clarity on. So this is your opportunity to, to make the most of that, to ask questions from the client on things where you seek clarity on. And then check out your competition, you know, because these are the guys you'll be bidding against. So you know them. You know them well sometimes, most of them. So you got to, you know how they price because you've seen the results before in, in previous tenders. So you, you just got to know your competition. It's always important so that you know what exactly you're up against. And then it's, this is also so important. I cannot stress this enough. The tender briefing, guys, either attend it yourself or send someone who is equally competent. Don't just send a friend who knows nothing about construction. Don't just send uh, someone, a lady, perhaps, who works in your kitchen. Don't just send anyone, the guy who cuts your grass. You know, it may, it may sound like a joke, but I've seen this happen so many times. People just send anyone just so that that person can fill out their name on the attendance register. Now, if you send someone who is not competent, a lot of stuff that you need to hear, those people are not going to be able to pick it up. So when you're pricing your tender, you know, you don't have any information. All you have is the bill of quantities. You didn't, you don't know what was discussed. You don't know the nitty gritties because a lot of stuff that is not on the bill of quantities you pick it up at the briefing just those subtle things that, that are so important you pick up at the at the tender briefing so it's so important guys to go there yourself or send someone who is equally competent now let's look at the site visit uh, some of the things to note let's just say now you've been at the meeting now you're going to the site visit in fact i have a template which i will i will load um, for you guys to download a uh, template you can use when you're attending a, a site briefing. It just tells you what to note and it's, it's just a beautiful template. You know, it tells you everything, the soil condition, things that we're gonna just briefly touch on. You know, things like um, the location of the site. It's important to know how far is the site from your head office? Where is the site? You know, is it in a, is it in a rural area? Is it in a, in a densely, populated densely populated area like um like a like a township because all those things are going to affect how you're going to price because pricing work in the rural area is different than pricing work in a, a very densely populated township setup setup for various reasons things like I mean, the ability to move your machines things like security you know so all those things it's so important guys to to know the location the site conditions, is this the, what does it look like, the site? What, is it bushy? Does, is there clearance that needs to be done? I mean, there's just so much stuff you, you, that you have to take note of, of the, um, your, your site conditions, the access to site. Is there a road? You know, if, if, you, if you're ordering material, will the trucks be able to deliver the material to the site yard, you know? If not, then you know that you've got to fix the excess. If you need to fix the excess, then you must know that you must put that in your price. Maybe you'll bring in a grader, 
and a row line, the water cart, maybe to just, just to do the road so that you, if, when the guys are delivering material, they can deliver the material at the yard, not somewhere where the, where the tar road ends. And then so you've then got to do what you call double handling, you know, because those guys will drop the material there, then you've got to fetch it from wherever they've dropped it off and bring it to your to your to your yard. And besides, if the access is not right, it's gonna really mess up the wear and tear of your vehicles. So it's important. And then you gotta look at the the soil conditions. You know, is this rocky soil? Is this is this is this soft? Is it clay? So it, it's all gonna you know affect you know how you're gonna be executing the work. It's gonna affect the cost of executing the work. You know, I would even suggest that sometimes you even dig trial holes just to see the profile of the soil just to see how much rock there is and at what depth is the rock because that will inform what type of uh, machinery you're going to use you might have to use an excavator say a, a pc 200 as opposed to a tlb you know you might even have to drill and blast so it's very important to to note the soil conditions Another one that's very important, availability of services, you know, things like ESCOM, you know, because to run an office, they in the, to run your site office, you need to have access to, to electricity. You got to see if there are ESCOM poles, do you need to, you know, apply for, for, for ESCOM to do installation, all those things is there a, a, a reception for your, for your, for your, for your cell phone coverage, coverage, you know, or do you need to now install like a little tower so that you can be able to have a cell phone reception, you know, is there water available, you know, on site, so it's, it, it, those things are important to note. And then your, 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 your spoil, where are you going to spoil material? You know, how far is it from the job? You know, where are you going to be spoiling the waste material? That's also important because it's going to affect, you know, your race at the end, because now if there's a long haulage, you know, for, for spoiling, you got to be aware of that so that you put that into your, into your race. And uh, the security on site, that's, that's that's very important because we know that theft is a problem theft is a big problem so you got to look at look at those things what 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 area am i in you know how safe is this area because if you're bringing in machinery expensive machinery you, you're going to be bringing in fuel you got to look into what kind of security measures you need to do here you might even have to erect a fence you know, if the, you might even have to erect a fence and get, uh, you know, proper security just so that you can make sure that, you know, your, your equipment and everything is safe. Availability of, of material, local material, you know, sometimes when you do a little bit of research, you know, uh, at the site, you can see if, okay, let's just say for argument's sake, you are going to be doing a pipeline job. And now you, you see that, okay, uh, the material is rocky, so you need to import backfill material. You've, you've excavated uh, the pipeline, you've put your bedding, you've put the pipe, now you need to import backfill material. If you had done your research, maybe there might be borrow pits around the area. You may not need to buy commercial material from a, uh, from a, from a, a commercial source. That is going to be very expensive. So if you've done your research and you see, oh, okay, I can get backfill material locally, that is going to, you know, obviously reduce your price when you tender. And that is the, the advantage that you're going to have over the next guy who has not done any research, who has not attended the site. I mean, who has basically after the briefing just left. So it's very important. And, and the last thing is basically the, the, the local labor rates. You may get that information from the, the local counselors. So it's also important because, I mean, the, those are the rates you're going to be paying the people at, you know. I think currently in South Africa, the minimum wage is 37 rand some odd an hour. And I know it's going up in September to 39 rand 52. So you've got to know what rates are applicable to that contract. You've got to know what rates are applicable to that contract so that when you are pricing your tender, you use the applicable rates. Do not use a rate 
you do not know if that's the applicable rate. You can imagine if you're pricing at, say, you say you're going to pay your people 150 Rand an hour, only to find out when you get to site, nobody, it's 39 Rand 50. Uh, I mean, excuse, excuse me, say you're going to, if you, you got to a situation where you thought to yourself, okay, I'll be paying my people 150 Rand a day, you know, and then, but when you get to site, you realize that you pay them 39 Rand an hour. That is equivalent of about 360 Rand a day. That's quite a huge discrepancy. So that is very, very important. And that is all we have for today, guys. Uh, we've covered uh, the first uh, module, and next week we will look at module two, which is going to be quite a, an extensive module. It may take some time. I might split it over three sessions or four sessions because there's a lot of calculation in that one. And yeah, so I hope you guys really, really um, enjoy this. You got in, yeah, you got some some input. You got some something you know uh, out of this. You know. As I said before, it's it's very basic. It's not for everyone. It's for people who are really uh, struggling in this industry because our industry is very, very diverse. There's all sorts of people. Some have qualifications, some don't have qualifications. So I've designed this material in such a way that, you know, I can help those guys who do not necessarily have the qualification, you know, to, to, to be able to compete in this industry, but they have the heart and desire to be business owners, to be contractors. So I, I hope this has been a blessing. There's a whole lot of material we're going to be getting through. And yeah, so remember, I will put my email there on my YouTube uh, channel. It will be there. So if you've got any queries, uh, drop me an email. I will hopefully respond uh, within a very short uh, space of time. Um, other than that, guys, thanks. It's been great. I'm happy to be on this platform. I'm looking forward to going on this journey with you guys, to see you guys, I mean, uh, acquire knowledge, to see you guys implement the knowledge you've acquired. So, all right. And that's it for today. Cheers, guys. Bye.